you are logged in to the joint CMLS, Council of MLS, and RISO, Real Estate Standards Organization webinar about the strategic importance of the data dictionary. Um, we do want to let everyone know that this uh, webinar is being recorded and that it will be posted to the CMLS.org website. Um, we will also be sending a link to all of you, the attendees, um, all of you, for uh, reference at, at a later point. So, my name is Danae Evans. I am the CEO of CMLS. Uh, CMLS is the national organization for MLSs, and we're working very hard to bring you important industry information and really keep you educated on all things MLS and real estate. Uh, if you're not already a member of CMLS, I would really encourage you to go to our website at cmls.org and look into joining our organization. Um, we work to bring you webinars like this. We do workshops. And uh, I think what we're most famous for is um, our co annual conference, uh, CMLS 2015 this year. I'd like to give a little reminder of that, that uh, it is going to be October 7th through the 9th in Kansas City, uh, hosted by Heartland MLS. Uh, working on a really fantastic agenda this year with, we've, we've got several speakers from outside of our industry uh, coming to discuss leadership, technology, and the future. Um, not only of real estate, but just a future of, of where are things happening overall. We are going to follow that up directly with, uh, right after those speakers, with industry panels so that you can quickly start having discussion and using all this great information you've, you've learned about how to apply this right at your own MLS and how to start implementing those things uh, right away. And as I'd like to refer to it, since coming on board is this year is going to be the best one ever. So hopefully, uh, looking forward to see several, many of you there. We, we're already at record-breaking registration numbers, so that's very exciting. Um, it does have its own website, and that is cmls2015.org. It's a beautiful new site we've, we've got up and working. So I would encourage all of you to go check that out, and we should be posting that agenda shortly. All right, so the reason for today's call. Uh, most of you know that the Data Dictionary Certification is mandated, and the deadline for that is the end of this year, December 31st, 2015. Uh, today we are discussing the benefits of implementing and adopting the Data Dictionary uh, to bring better efficiencies to the real estate industry. This year, CMLS officially adopted Data Dictionary as one of our initiatives. And really what that means is we just wanted to work towards helping to get all of our CMLS members certified by the end of this year to meet this deadline and uh, bring all the information and resources together to help make it as easy as possible. Uh, we decided the best way to do that was partner with uh, Revo. And so today I'm, I'm really grateful and appreciate the collaboration with, with Revo and Jeremy Crawford. He's their new executive director. Um, and today is the first of three webinars that we're going to do over the next several months to um, help get the information out and have conversations with, with MLS execs who have gone through it and their technology team so that you guys all have the, the tools and information that you need to make this, make this happen and, and as easy as possible. So. Um, I say this with all um, love and respect, but today's webinar is what I like to call the No Geek Speak. Jeremy will cover that a little bit more, but uh, it's really talking about the benefits, the value proposition to not only your MLS, but your participants, brokers, stakeholders, everybody involved in, in real estate and, and, and why this is so important. Uh, I will let you know in the, I think this is over on the right-hand side, uh, there's the bar for questions. We are going to have a specific, you're going to be listening to Jeremy, and uh, I'll let him introduce our panelists, both who are CMLS members. One is our board member there, Mr. Richard Renton, and uh, Rebecca Jensen from MRED. Um, so they're going to go run through. They've got some information and talk about their experiences. But if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to type them into the right side of the panel. And then we will have a question and answer session at the end 
We are set to go for an hour, and Jeremy will talk a little more about this, but we do have extra time. So if it's really getting to some great conversation, um, if you need to be done in an hour, please feel free to jump off the call. But if you would like to stay on and have additional conversation, we will be leaving it open for um, as long as you have questions. Within reason, I think we only have an hour and a half to do our windows. So, um, But thank you so much for uh, joining us today, and I, I'm certain that you will get lots of information out of this. And so with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Uh, Jeremy Crawford and uh, let him start sharing all the brilliance. Thank you, Danae. Good morning to everyone on Central to West Coast, and good afternoon to the East Coast. With first to station, bring educational information out to the MLS community through the CMLS channel and the wonderful wealth of educational information that CMLS is providing out to the MLS community. Uh, today, we're the, for the first part, we're going to talk about the strategic strategic importance of the Rezo Dictionary, and we're really going to look at why standards exist, why Rezo exists as an organization, and what we are, and then specifically, what briefly is the data dictionary in non-geek speak, and what are the benefits of that? And alongside of me, I have Rebecca Jensen, who's the president and CEO of the Midwest Real Estate Data in Chicago. And MRED is a data dictionary certified MLS, and Rebecca is on the board of directors of the Real Estate Standards Organization. And alongside her is Richard Renton. Richard Renton is the CEO of Triad MLS in North Carolina. Richard is working with his vendor, CoreLogic, for data dictionary implementation. Richard is a board of director member of both Rezo as well as the Council of MLS. So briefly to look at our agenda for today, we're going to talk about the standards and what Rezo is and focus on the benefits of using the Rezo standards. I will briefly reiterate the NAR policy mandates and certification requirements, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. And Rebecca and Richard will be providing great insight into the benefits and the pain points that the Rezo standards are aiding alongside of their local market areas so you can equate that to your market areas and take some of this information back to your leadership as you deem it is appropriate. So the first thing I'd like to start out with is overall what are standards in the world that we exist today? And what you have on your screen right now may seem slightly confusing. It may look as if someone is doing maintenance on a train. What is actually occurring is that there is a universal standard for how train tracks are built and the width of those train tracks. When you travel across Asia and European nations, there are a couple of countries that actually do not adhere to the national train track standard, and their train tracks are three inches in difference. So as a passenger, you want to go from point A to point B. You are stopped in the middle and they actually have to tear the train apart and replace on the bottom what is called a boogie so that the standard train track is converted over into what is known as the Russian standard, which is a slightly smaller. So as a passenger, you're wanting to deliver yourself from one point to another in an efficient manner, and now you are stuck in the middle of a train yard for three to six hours while they change out the boogies in a lengthy process that is really based upon a lack of adoption of standards. And you can imagine mentally how much staff time, effort, and money and inefficiencies is actually going into this process as opposed to a long-term investment of standardizing the train tracks across the entire European and Asian nations, if you will. And so this equates to directly us in the real estate industry as well as technology standards. So we need real estate standards that are very similar to the benefits out in the world of other standards. If you consider the web that we know as today, HTML is the standard that's created by an open source community. 
without HTML being created as an open standard, we really would not have the internet at all from my perspective. If we did, it definitely would not look like anything we have today. And the standards that are available and RISA works to develop for the real estate industry is really focused on interoperability and innovation, reducing the complexities of what you might think of the train track issues are, and impacting everyone. Without the standards, we have complete confusion in the industry and complete inefficiencies in the industry. But with standards, and not the actual creation of standards, but the adoption and implementation of standards, we're really promoting efficiency through the entire transaction life cycle of every aspect of the real estate industry. Most of us deal directly with the residential real estate industry and our local market, but as you consider the tr transaction of purchasing a home, that actually starts to expand out into other industries. And so we want to focus not only on standards that benefit the residential real estate transaction, but the actual start to finish entire life cycle of a transaction that might include the brokers, the agents, the vendors that are involved, the multiple listing services that most of you are in attendance today, but also talk about outside of real estate as we deal with locally and take a look at social media, how the search engines work in relation to finding a property, how the lending institutions take a chance to underwrite those properties for mortgages, how the appraisal industry evaluates those, how the governmental and tax come into place. So we're really touching on many different types of customers of standards from the consumer all the way up to the corporate enterprise and the broker and agent and everyone in between in the process. So with that being said, what is Rezo? Many of you on the call are very familiar with the Real Estate Standards Organization, but some of you are extremely new. And I've been fielding some great questions from those that are very new to understanding what RISO is. So we develop standards for the real estate organization for the high-level benefits just repeated. We are a nonprofit organization, and we're a membership-based organization very similar to the Council of MLS. We have members from the brokerage community, from technology vendors, from associations, and from the National Association of Realtors, as well as other related standards bodies, organizations, and associations that are affiliated with the real estate industry. So we take collective input from all of the members in a volunteer fashion to create the work product. And Rezo's work products, to be clear, are the actual technical data standards. Rezo was formed loosely among the geeks in the industry roughly 15 years ago to talk about how data could be transferred from one point to another. And that was the technical data standards that Rezo worked on for 10 solid years and continues to do so. But in addition to that, we'll talk about the data dictionary, and the data dictionary is another technical standard from the Real Estate Standards Organization that's been created to further add efficiencies and innovation opportunities into the real estate industry. We are an open source community, so our standards are free to anyone. Anyone can use the standards, anyone can contribute to the standards. We do have membership levels, and membership does come with some benefits that are not open to the public. We encourage membership and encourage heightened participation with Rezo as we want as many opinions from local markets as we can to review business issues from every possible industry affiliate, such as brokers, MLSs, and vendors, to be able to work together to create a standard that works for that. And so therefore, we're set up with work groups, committees, and essentially think tanks where we have like-minded souls from all different types of companies coming together in volunteer efforts to try to solve similar business issues, one being how do we get data from an MLS to a broker or to a vendor or vice versa in an efficient manner so that those entities can work on new technology development and innovation. 
not painful maintenance as you see in the train world. So RISO has a very specific vision and mission that's going to carry us through the next five years. And our corporate vision is a streamlined real estate technology industry. And our mission is to actually create, promote, and adopt standards that are driving efficiency. So those are our goals as an organization. So if you can take a mental note of the train before, Rezo is trying to take the data and shoot it across the nation as quickly we, as we can in a common format, in a common manner, so that it is really nonstop delivery of that MLS data and everyone involved can really focus on their own actual business needs and not deal with the cumbersome maintenance of inefficiency. So as I mentioned, we had worked on the transportation of data for many, many years. And over the past three years, we have now started working on the data dictionary. And the data dictionary is essentially our Rosetta Stone for defining real estate fields. So there are roughly 770 MLSs out in the nation and every MLS has their own listing input forms and their own names and definitions for how an agent would enter in data or a broker would take a listing and aid the agent and put that into the MLS. It is our goal to define a standard nationwide that encompasses as much of the local business need in every market so that everyone is actually speaking the same language because today in some instances we are speaking 770 languages. So this is really a focus to try to make the life easier up and down the food chain if you will and we want to try to translate as many MLS data sets as possible into a common language for the good of every entity in the industry. Some of the overall data dictionary benefits, if you can imagine, is really easily sharing data among the many different entities. You're listing data, which was the basis, but now we're looking at prospect data, contact data, save searches. An agent's going to want access to not only property data, but their own CRM type of data, their leads, if you will, across multiple products. Agents do use the MLS as their primary tool set today, and they do that very successfully. However, they also like to augment that with other tools. And we really want to improve the efficiencies, but also improve the quality of those tool sets. And speaking the same language is helping provide quality between those applications an agent uses, a broker uses, and the tools that MLS provides out to their members and their subscribers. So the data dictionary has a very high impact on the real estate industry as a whole. And I want to look at now individually where are some of the specific benefits for the MLSs, the brokers, the agents, and the vendors. And I'll start with a very high level overview and then I'm going to defer to our panelists as we go through each industry section to add some commentary where they see in their local markets the benefits for them and their different sets of customers that they deal with. So currently, there are 770 roughly MLSs in the nation, but there are over a thousand different real estate data sources. And that's really in the residential marketplace. If we expanded our thought process out to commercial properties that some MLSs handle or augmenting data, real estate data actually could grow much further than the thousand different real estate data they choose to today. So the first and foremost thing is, is we want to be able to share with consistency the data that is out there. There are vendors that need to aggregate data from multiple MLSs, and MLSs today spend an enormous time hand-holding the vendors in a support manner as to how their data is defined and what those fields actually mean. The benefit for the data dictionary is actually reducing the support costs and the time and efforts by the MLSs who have to provide this level of technical support to vendors to define for them how a particular item such as a patio or a lanai is defined and displayed in their MLS so the vendor knows how to put that into their vendor product. And this is really with the consistency helping improve the data quality 
in less data mapping errors, and I've seen these as my history with MLSs firsthand, this is enormous level and effort that all MLSs deal with as well as their technology vendors as opposed to simplistically having the data transmitted and received as it's defined and intended at a national definition scale. Once the implementation of the data dictionary is across many markets, the MLS members start to get better choices as to those that consume RISO compliant data. They lower their cost of maintenance in assimilating the data across multiple MLSs, and they actually start to create efficiencies where the time to deliver MLS software to the market is reduced and the focus is on innovation. And so those are a few high level benefits from an MLS perspective that I want to call on. Rebecca and Richard now to go ahead and augment to see what they have in their local markets as well from the MLS benefits. So this is Rebecca Jensen here, um, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. I have been very passionate about RESO for many years now because I think that it's something that's absolutely vital for MLSs to adopt, and it's not just a benefit to the MLSs. Um, Jeremy, you talked about the benefits to brokers, agents, vendors. Um, you know, we're, we all live in the same ecosystem, and so if there's a benefit to my subscribers, there's directly a benefit to me as an MLS. Um, so you talked about consistency and less errors. I think that that is definitely a benefit to the MLS because, you know, there are so many MLSs out there, and we can't assume that the data that is coming from each individual MLS is being translated properly when you know vendors get a hold of it um, or brokers are looking at it. And so the consistency that comes with adopting the RESO data dictionary cannot be overstated. Um, so I'm a big proponent of that. And I also um, want to make sure that people understand that RESO is sort of a neutral ground where we are just a technology organization that describes the data, and that's the purpose of the data dictionary. Um, it does not go into anything regarding the business rules. So I love your train analogy where we can deliver through RESO um, you know, a data package from point A to point B, but it is completely up to the individual MLSs or brokers to decide things um, with respect to that data. So in the train analogy, that would be, you know, how many trains are running on that line, uh, who's driving the train, how many passengers, et cetera, et cetera. I think that the analogy is a great analogy. Um, so it, it allows MLSs to kind of release one of the burdens, which is, you know, what, what's happening with our data being translation, translated, and then focus really on the business rules outside of the RESO standard. So. I think that my brokers here in the MRED marketplace don't want to have to translate the data with their broker, you know, with their vendors that are serving those broker products. Um, and so they have definitely come to me here and said, you need to promote the RESO standards. Uh, last week we just finished with our strategic planning process and adopting the RESO API was uh, one of the very top goals for the next coming year because brokers definitely get that you know, the MLSs should be making those translations of the data and not other people. So uh, RESO has definitely been something that has been well received in the MRED marketplace. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Richard, do you want to reiterate any direct MLS benefits before we move into the broker category? Yeah, yes, and thank you again, Jeremy and Danae, for inviting me to participate in this panel. You know. Um, we are a mid-sized regional MLS. We're comprised of about 4,000 members. But, you know, as with any MLS, more and more of what we do and actually have done over the past several years is facilitate the transfer of that MLS content to various entities on behalf of our broker members. So, you know, yes, we realize that our primary mission is to support our members in the functionality of the MLS system and, you know, to ensure that we keep those primary system uh, up to date, but honestly in the past several years we've seen that transition over to more and more resources devoted to the distribu distribution of that broker content for their use in the internet display of their listings. So 
you know, in addition with the distribution of that content going to so many recipients, whether it's broker, vendor, syndicator, pick, realtor.com, et cetera, we've come to realize how our little mid-sized MLS really plays with all the entities in the world that get this content. So I guess what I mean by that is like many MLSs across the country, we have some unique business rules, field labels, definitions. We have policies governing the use of the content we provide. And the actual content may contain unique values, perhaps not used in other MLSs. Um, so, you know, we realize that, you know, the, the, the benefits for us of adopting a standard are, you know, there's so many pros, but it doesn't come without a few potential cons. Um, some of you, you know, as an example, our brokers enter actual square footage into, on listings when they enter them into the RMLS. We have an algorithm that calculates a range value for each individual square foot field, and then it automatically places that calculated range value into a corresponding range field tied to each you know, square footage field. And newsflash, there's no accommodation for square footage range fields in the data dictionary. So we look at this, and we're left with a few options. You know, Of course, compliance with the data dictionary is not an option. We plan on being fully compliant in the date frame required, but we also realize that you know, under our current rule structure where we require only the display of range value on any active type listing, this could present a big problem as providing any access to our data dictionary compliant database might violate our IDX policies. So again, it leaves us, our leadership, like many other MLSs across the board, in a position to review those policies and ascertain if they're still relevant for 2015 and beyond. I'm sure there's many of you guys out there with these unique situations. Those of us that have been involved in RESO have worked hard to ensure that the data dictionary accommodates the majority of that real estate related data content and standardizes it for use by all entities. That economy of scale, you know, the Rosetta Stone uh, economy of scale, so to speak, is the direction I think all of us need to embrace because ultimately all of us are dependent upon the brokers for our livelihood. And we're, if we're not offering them a fair trade value in return for what they're paying us, then we're really not doing our jobs. You know, this is just one little unique issue from just one MLS, but when you consider the number of MLSs in the country that are dealing with this, we felt that our participation in RESO, not only us, but the phenomenal talent that exists in every level of those work groups all the way up to Jeremy, they're going to guide us on those right tracks moving forward. So long story short, and I know it was long, as an MLS, we're going to really, the deeply detailed review of our database schema is an excellent practice, and it's going to help us ensure that our rules and policies are relevant to the time we're living in. Um, in other words, this ain't your granddaddy's MLS. So could it result in us having to change some things? Of course, but, you know, I look at all the changes we've dealt with over the past. Some of our own members have either disagreed or faced difficulty in accommodating change. Through thick and thin, we've survived, but I think us and our leadership needs to accept the fact that change happens, and we need to learn to embrace it to better meet their needs. So, sorry, a little long, but... I, I think well, that's a great point, Richard, which is, you know, it's not your granddaddy's MLS, and technology moves so incredibly fast, and, you know, it's always a challenge from an MLS standpoint to look at technology out there and say, hey, what should we bring into our market and what shouldn't we? And it's a similar conversation, I imagine, from the vendor side, which is which markets should we introduce first and why? And, you know, so there are definitely a lot of different MLSs of different sizes out there, but the, to the extent that MLSs can lower that barrier to entry from vendors, then that can only increase competition within that MLS's market space. Um, because the Reso Data Dictionary will make it a lot easier for vendors to go and introduce their product in a marketplace where they know that the inefficiency has already been extracted by the MLS implementing a Reso standard. And so the effort that they have to put forward is completely reduced. So that can And only... I think we... Yeah, go ahead. No, go I was just going to say, I agree, because, you know, we can all feel the pain points of what has transpired up to date. I think every one of us participating in this call has felt pain points at every level of providing this content to vendors. I mean, there's no doubt RESO was necessary. Vendors and have been Richard, calling for it. Yep. And, Richard, I'll, I'll jump slides here, because you, you made a great statement that 
your broker customers and how does this impact your broker customers and I believe within many MLSs brokers sit in the boardroom table and the brokers are helping driving decisions at the strategic or sometimes even operational level of the MLS and it's important to everyone to to understand and be able to reiterate back to their leadership who are often brokers what are the benefits of implementing data dictionary? I have been receiving calls from association executives and MLS CEOs with the questions that they have to go to their brokers to let them know they need to work with their vendor to implement the data dictionary for the NAR policy, but they need talking points for their brokers. And Rebecca touched on it a little bit from the vendor side, but from a broker's perspective, having a national implemented data dictionary standard is going to provide those brokers less investment interfacing with multiple MLSs and so many brokers exist in multiple markets today and many brokers are growing and they would like to exist in multiple markets and the absence of the data dictionary standard can be an extreme investment for them. So this is going to provide them the ability to have less investment being able to access MLS data from multiple locations and then they're going to be able to have faster time to market. So as they launch a new office in a new area or they want to launch a new technology product using the data dictionary standard that would be adopted is they're going to have faster time to market. They're going to be working in new areas quicker or they're going to be able to provide technology tools and services to their agents much faster when everyone is speaking the same language, i.e. the Rosetta Stone data dictionary. And they're also going to experience some consistency. There are many broker back office systems today that do combine this data. When they do, they combine it incorrectly. Everyone understands, I believe, that there are many words in Russian or Tagal that do not in any manner translate to English. So as good as the technology vendor is, and as understanding of the MLS listing input form as the broker and the agent is, there are oftentimes no one-to-one -one conversion for that particular data field, i.e. there is no language conversion, and when that occurs, they do not have consistent data and displays across their back-end systems and the tools that the brokers have. And providing this is going to be able to eliminate a lot of those inefficiencies and it's going to eliminate a lot of their support time and cost, cost and time that they're actually incurring calling the MLS, getting help, and paying in technology fees for maintenance where they want to look at doing those in an innovative fashion. Across the industry there was a letter a few years ago that listed quite a few of the pain points that brokers experience. Mm -hmm. The data dictionary is a direct contributing factor to aid many of those broker pain points. And I think, Rebecca, you or Richard could iterate some of the comments in your local market that you hear from your brokers that, that span market areas and have difficulty spanning across MLSs. So maybe you all would like to uh, chime in and, and provide some commentary about your broker's perspective. I could add just that, you know, essentially, um, you know, you look at that concept of, you know, we've heard from some pretty big entities representing some very large brokers that that was some of their pain points. And a direct, one that was directly related to that was the length of time it took MLSs to process, let's say, IDX agreements. And part of that process in all those discussions that we heard was the fact that some of those approvals didn't happen until the data was up and running on the other site, et cetera, before it could be final approved. Well, the, the individual 800 sets of business rules that a current vendor or even an internal broker that operates on a national level, you know, having to manage that many independent feeds with that many different set of business rules, you're still going to have unique business rules. You'll never get those consistent. Well, somebody might, but um, you know, the bottom line is, is that if we all agree that there's a common standard, we can map what we have to a standard. It does improve all of those things that the brokers were feeling pain points on and allows them more flexibility in choosing who they work with. 
Well, and yeah, again, I want to just reiterate that RESO isn't really looking at the business rules standpoint. That is definitely up to each individual MLS, but to the extent that the data can be standardized and we can all describe it the same way, that is definitely where RESO is positioned. And I want to emphasize that the data dictionary is a living document. You know, we have the data dictionary out today that is a great start um, that people can certify on right away and that there will be immediate benefit to the brokers in those markets that can get a data dictionary certified feed. But part of the beauty of RESO really is that all of these minds from across the industry come together to work on the tough issues of the day. And so I can totally envision the data dictionary in the future addressing whatever that might be. I remember during the housing bubble burst and the short sell crisis where MLSs were kind of scrambling to figure out what short sells were and how that could be reflected in the data and you know, the MLSs went about it all different ways to describe those listings that were unfortunately involved in a short sell. Well, RESO is a uniquely positioned entity to be able to bring people from across the nation together and say, okay, we're all trying to solve this individually. Would it make more sense if we pulled the collective wisdom from across the industry and came up with a standard on how to describe these transactions? and then roll it out across the nation. So no matter what market you're in or what consumer you're dealing with that might be relocating or whatnot, would be able to understand what's happening. And that's something that is one of the very reasons that I wanted to become involved in RESO, which was to be at the table during those conversations so I can see what's happening outside of my individual market because it's only a matter of time before those issues affect everybody. So. I think that there is ongoing value and benefit to being involved in the RESO organization outside of just, you know, implementing the data dictionary. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. And Rebecca does make a great point that we have been very reactive as an industry as technology is speeding us by because it's changing so quickly. We now have the opportunity to shore up some of the reactive nature through the implementation and adoption of the data dictionary and start to become proactive so that the next issue, such as short sell, that occurs, instead of that being solved at a local level through extensive research and time and effort of the MLS staff and the brokers and the agents, it could be solved at a national level where like minds are put together across the nation with the same exact problem of how do we deal with these short sale properties and how do we define those inside of the MLS and RESO can help come up with a definition at the cusp of that issue coming about as opposed to two to three years or six years later. So we are in a great position to take the data dictionary and move it from reactionary to a proactive market that's going to support brokers' needs as they come about as opposed to quite a bit time later. And I know that we have about 22 minutes on the schedule. I'd like to hop into two more categories of benefits because I want to give time for Q&A and everything. So uh, we, can, we can talk quickly that the agent benefits similar to the broker, and the agent is the MLS customer, if you will, the subscriber in addition to the participant, the broker, and the agent's going to reap some of similar benefits from the brokerage standpoint is they're going to start to see consistency across all of their products when they take a look at how a property is defined as a short sale property. We want them to be able to see that consistently so their agent IDX websites, which their customers go to, as well as their MLS system, their mobile applications, their lead generation and management tools are all showing short sale defined in the same manner. So it's very consistent for the agent and the relationship between the agent and consumer is consistent. There is often the conversation that the consumer has information that the agent does not have. The reality is while that does occur, sometimes it occurs because the consumer is seeing different definitions of real estate data fields on property detail sheets 
And it's not that the consumer has additional information, they have different information and it takes a conversation between the agent and the consumer to figure that out. With the data dictionary, that's providing consistency and eliminating some of those pain points the agents are seeing today. As Richard iterated, the complexity of integrating a data feed from a new MLS is affecting the agent. Agents will be at San Diego at the NAR Fall Convention. They'll be buying products on the Expo 4. They'll be taking those products back and realizing they need MLS data integrated into that product. And the time to market for them in their mind should be instantly, not three months. And we want the data dictionary to be able to help provide that and provide them new software quickly in a more unified manner between themselves, the brokers, and their customers, the consumers. And without continuing on the agent, jumping to the vendor, as Rebecca and Richard mentioned quite a bit, is we also have benefits of the data dictionary out to the vendor community. So those vendors are going to be able to innovate their products and reduce their support time and cost of actually implementing products with MLS data as the nation does adopt the data dictionary, the vendors then become accustomed to one common language and they no longer have to belittle their maintenance efforts on adding different languages into their products, but they can start by innovating those products because they can quickly implement the data into those products when they speak the exact same language. They don't have to learn the new language at all. And by reducing all those aggregation efforts, they can focus on the product innovation and the growth that the agents want and that the consumers would like to see as well. And Richard and um, Rebecca, would you all like to comment on the agent or the vendor side that you see in your local marketplaces, especially Rebecca, that you've now implemented the data dictionary and certified and are providing that out to some of your vendors? Sure. Um, so we have had vendors request the new data dictionary field from MRED. Um, and I, I'll be honest, it hasn't been a whole lot because we're recently certified, but I anticipate that that uh, request will just uh, be exponential over the next year as they understand that MLSs are all getting on the same page. Um, but yeah, Jeremy, you're absolutely right that agents are going to be going to these trade shows and they're going to see different products that help them differentiate themselves in the marketplace with consumers. And so, you know, a lot of comments that I've heard here at MRED is that I want MRED to be a business partner. We want the data to fuel what it is we're doing with consumers. We absolutely don't want MRED to be a roadblock in the adoption of new technologies that we think are appropriate for our customers. And so I see that completely in line with the vision of the MLS to help our broker and agent customers, you know, do what it is they think needs to be done in their individual marketplace. And so RESO really will foster that competition among vendors to be able to go after those individual deals with brokerages and agents to, you know, give them what they need. And part of um, sort of the dysfunction in the past with MLSs doing their own proprietary delivery method of listing data is that you sort of had to be an insider to the real estate industry if you were a vendor in order to get your product to be adopted. Um, but with the advent of the data dictionary and a, a, a global way um, to adopt the transport, and I'm talking specifically about the RESO API, you could go to India or any other country and find a developer that has never worked in real estate before and you can engage their services to write you whatever it is you think will help you differentiate yourself as an agent um, and the MLS data will be there for you. It won't be this steep learning curve on the part of vendors to come in and say, okay, I understand the MLS has data, but we have no idea how to access it on a timely basis and how to import it into our systems. Um, so I think that RESO has been very, very smart in making sure that the standards and the technology that we adopt um, are globally accepted standards that any vendor from any country anywhere would be able to look at and understand because they've seen it before in their you know, software engineering field. So I think that's a huge benefit that RESO can bring to the real estate industry um, is kind of bringing us up to speed with the other industries out there that are in technology. 
and we had a great comment in the panel as well that I wanted to mention, and with the interest of time, I want to keep going, but a uh, great comment is that consider that vendors may start pricing their products based upon whether or not the MLS is data dictionary compliant. Not being data dictionary compliant is going to increase cost to the vendor, so it's something to consider a conversation with your brokers, your agents, and your leadership for the benefits of implementing the data dictionary is that the pricing out there could start to change based upon if the MLS is going to provide a data dictionary based fee that would be just to cover a lower or higher maintenance cost of providing that. So it was a great comment on the panel and I think the individual that provided that. Um, there was another question which I'll address with this next slide is um, as we move past um, looking at all of the many benefits, and I believe that you could tell Richard, Rebecca, and myself could have a five-hour call and still continue discussing that, is I wanted to move into letting everyone know what is the NAR MLS policy mandates that exist. And these were put in place um, last November, and essentially there is an NAR MLS policy mandate that the MLS must be Data Dictionary 1.3 or 1.4, those are versions that we have today, certified by January 1st, i.e. the end of the year. And so we have 770 MLS that would be um, primary, primarily realtor-owned or affiliated and would be mandated by the NAR policy. So the first bullet there is Data Dictionary certification. However, I do want to remind everyone that is not the only aspect of the policy. Earlier, Rebecca mentioned the API. We won't get into the details of what the API actually is, but I just want everyone to be aware that there will be a second certification requirement by the NAR mandate by June of 2016, and then there will be an update mandate by January of 2017. So any realtor owned or affiliated MLS must certify through Rezo and must do that on an annual basis for the data dictionary and looking forward the API transport mechanism. And the question uh, that came in, which I've been asked often, is what happens to an MLS if they either do not certify in time or they choose not to certify at all? And my response is this is an NAR MLS policy. So NAR would dictate the consequences of not following the MLS policy. It's my personal understanding and experience that could be related to an association MLS losing their E&O insurance, potentially, but that is something that the MLS would need to deal directly with NAR as we do create the certification program and standards, but as Rebecca reiterated, we are not directly part of the policy body, so it would be up to NAR to enforce the policy or lack thereof of implementing the data dictionary. And looking ahead, and we'll get into some more Q&A, but looking ahead, that standards adoption is a long and growing process. There are thousands of fields that each individual unique MLS has in their database. The current data dictionary certification program certifies on 166 core fields. That is not the level of data dictionary adoption we would like to see. We would like to see a national standard with a much larger data dictionary set of core fields and be able to elevate that as many of those fields are applicable to IDX display some of those fields that are not there today would be more applicable to items such as statistics, evaluations, broker back office systems from an accounting perspective. So the data dictionary is not done. The data dictionary is a living, breathing, and growing based upon industry input. And alongside of that, the certification program is to tie adoption with elevating your implementation of the data dictionary. So while you get certified this year, I want everyone to understand they're not done because we will need to certify every year. And as we certify, 
through 2020, it will be certifying on a growing set of data dictionary. So eventually, through the slow process, everyone is adopting a much higher set of the same language so that vendors have a much larger data set than they did with the initial adoption of the core fields. So we do have a plan at Rezo, and it is online at rezo.org slash certification that you can see the plan and you can see the testing rules and the details as to what's going to be required in each year all the way up through 2020. My final slide, and I would like to start answering questions, um, is really how can you get involved? Again, we're a membership-based organization. So for those of you that are not members, we would love to encourage you to be members. And we do even have discounted programs. We know that every MLS will need to certify. For smaller MLSs, it's actually cheaper to become a member and have a member discount on certification than it is to be a non-member because we want participation. We would like participation from all the MLSs nationwide to provide us their local unique information so we can see if it makes a fit in the data dictionary and we can provide commonality. Uh, my example is I thought Lanai's were only in Hawaii. I was mistaken. Lanai's are also in Florida and the educational process of that was bringing in those from Florida to also say we have Lanai's as well and this is the definition so can you create something that covers Hawaii in Florida. That's a very simplistic field. However, it is an example, and we need nationwide participation from every micro market out there to grow that data dictionary. And I also want to remind everyone how does certification work? Is the MLS is required by the MLS policy to get certified, therefore the MLS must apply for certification. We will work with your technology vendors to make sure you do get certified, your typical MLS vendor, if you will, However, it is up to the MLS to apply for certification, not the MLS vendor. So make sure you contact your vendors and ask them about certification. And you also start to consider including certification inside of your IDX and data licensing agreements for the vendors so you know that they are pulling data in the manner that you are defining data for them. And we would really look for you all to support Rezo just through the local, state, and national levels as there are many state policies that follow the NAR policies as a model and would look to implement this. So we would really like for the MLSs to support that. And we do have a fall conference just as CMLS in Austin, both business executives and technical individuals, and we call it geeks and Greeks as well. Um, so I want to go ahead and open it up to Q&A. We have some questions in the panel, and I would like to go ahead and respond to um, the first one we have here is if you have a data dictionary compliant server feeding data, can you still keep up your old RET server feeding the data? And the answer is yes, absolutely. It would be horrific for an MLS to cut a current data feed to 30, 50, 100 vendors and have all those vendors switch over to the data dictionary based data feed you are perfectly allowed to have other data feeds that are not data dictionary required for certification. However, you do need to have a data dictionary certified data delivery mechanism, and that was the question. Uh, there was one other question that was, if you certify on the data dictionary, but the broker chooses not to allow certain fields for an IDX or a VAL type of feed, does the data dictionary require you to provide that to remain certified? And the answer is no. The data dictionary makes sure that you can deliver the field that's defined in the data dictionary, but it does not set any business rule or policies on specific fields you actually give out to your vendors. So it's very important to understand that we want to make sure that your definitions and your languages are the same but your local business policies and your local MLS policies and your agreements and what you provide in an actual data feed per different sets, IDX, VAL, broker, et cetera, that is still up to you and the data dictionary certification program and adoption and implementation does not involve itself at all with how you define your local policies there. Um, there are many questions here, 
online, so I'm taking a look at um, uh, one question. Does RISO have suggested model language to insert the RISO certification in the MLS um, data licensing agreements? We do not today. I am going to take a note right now. I think that's a great idea, and what we would do is we would work with the Council of MLS to see if it deems appropriate to have some sample language in the Council of MLS, MLS best practices on how they address data licensing agreements. Um, another question we have, if our MLS vendor has mapped 150 core fields, should we start an application process for certification? This is a great question. When do you want to apply for certification? You will want to make sure you check with your MLS vendor to see what their schedule is and to see when they're going to be available. Uh, 166 core fields are required for certification. If you're at 150 of the 166 core fields, it sounds as if you are really, really close to being ready. Uh, we do process applications based upon when they were received. We do have to certify 700 MLSs, hopefully that they will apply by the end of the year. So it would be important to go ahead and get your application in if you feel your vendor is really close to being able to certify you. So you don't have to apply the day that they're ready. I wouldn't suggest though that you apply three or four months before you think that they would actually be ready for certification. Um, Jerry, there will can I be jump a reason there real quick and just make yes, a comment go, go on ahead. that. Because I've Please heard from record. other MLSs that there's some confusion out there between the data dictionary version 1.3 and 1.4, and maybe it would be smart for them just to wait for 1.4 before trying to certify. And um, so I would recommend that you don't wait. All of the work that you would do on 1.3 would still be completely valid on 1.4. It's just an extension of it. So. Like Jeremy said, there are a different set of core fields under 1.3. 1.4 um, just furthers the descriptiveness of the listing data. And so nothing that you've done on 1.3 would be sort of counteracted or changed really in 1.4. And we can certify you on 1.3 or 1.4. So as you work with your MLS vendor, if your MLS vendor, 1.4 is already in production. If your MLS vendor would like for you to use 1.4 as opposed to 1.3 for your implementation, then that is fine and we can certify you directly on 1.4 and you can skip 1.3. Um, yeah, I just don't want people to think that they should wait. And at the RISO board level, we have absolutely talked about not making incremental releases like every other month, and so people don't know where they're going. We will at most make, I think we decided like one or two per year on the data dictionary, so people have an incentive to adopt what is currently out there. Correct. And the current schedule for 1.5 would be between Q1 and Q2 of next year. 1.4 was just approved this month, and 1.3 was roughly a year ago. So at most, there would be two revisions of the data dictionary. However, the current schedule is one of those. So, um, so keep a lookout for that, but we will be growing the data dictionary, not changing it to where you have to try and retrofit, which would be considered somewhat of a conversion of your field. Um, Looking at a couple other questions, will you be adding waterfront to the data dictionary? This is a great example of input that we would need. So if there are fields in the data dictionary or there are values such as you would you know, pick exterior features and you see that those are missing, then please provide those to us. Email those to, you can email those simplistically to info at rezo.org if you're not a member of Rezo and we'll pick that up and send that over to the Data Dictionary Work Group to review. Um, looking through a few more questions here. Can I mention Our something just real briefly, Jeremy? Yeah, go ahead, Richard, please, Bob. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, one of the things we had talked about and, you know, in closing, identifying not only those pain points, but also the benefits of that data standard standard to each real estate related entity, whether it's ML, we've identified MLS, broker, agent, vendor, 
it's important because we realize they each have unique issues to deal with. But you know, we also recognize that most of these pain points and the benefits are shared between these entities. You know, I think our folks see these standards as helping all MLSs support their members through facilitating that common data set for all these folks to utilize, a higher standard, if you will. So, you know, and finally, you know, unlike trickle-down economics, we see data standards as a rising tide that will lift all boats. So. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Um, a question, will the, what will the annual renewal date be for certification? When you certify, that is your annual renewal date. So if you certify on November the 18th, 2015, your certification is good for one year from the date that you certify. So the annual renewal date will be based upon when you achieve your certification and then the following year you'll need to certify again. Um, uh, there's a, a question here, would you expect Project Upstream to be RESO compliant? Uh, my response to that is, is my current set of information is that Project Upstream is using the data dictionary as part of their platform and that will be there. We are not involved directly with the development of Project Upstream. Um, we're not affiliated with Project Upstream. However, we do know and understand that they are going to be using the Rezo Data Dictionary for their platform as it is a technology standard already created and it would be more efficient for them to use that as to create their own separate data dictionary. So I do know that that is the case today. That information may change, but chances are as that platform is developed, they will continue to use the Rezo Data Dictionary. Um, will we be paying every year to certify how often and how much this could be a burden on smaller MLSs? It's a great question. Uh, there is a certification fee schedule for any non-member, a certification application is $750, one-time fee for that certification, which is good for one year. That covers the cost of Rezo staff and technology tool sets to test to make sure that your data dictionary is compliant. For smaller MLSs, as I mentioned earlier, we actually want to encourage participation and so if you're under 2,000 MLS subscribers, you can join Rezo and have a certification for $650. So it's $100 cheaper today to join Rezo and reap full member benefits, and those cover every employee within your organization, can have any access into the membership site of Rezo, the work groups, the work products, the discussion forums, the networking assistance, that uh, exist within the membership community and then your certification and you get that for a hundred dollars less. We do have membership tiers that grow based upon the size of the organization, be it an MLS or be it a technology vendor. You can see those tiers online at rezo.org slash join so that you can see the member benefits and the details there as well as the fee schedules and if you go to rezo.org slash certification you can also see the certification fee schedule. So hopefully that helps to answer that question. And there's a further questions on that. You can email me directly if you want to look as to what your exact fee schedule were if you were over 2,000 subscribers. Um, hey, Jeremy, I'd also like to yes. comment on that and just reiterate a point you made earlier, which is RESO is a nonprofit organization. And really, the cost of those certification fees and the membership fees go directly into making sure that RESO can function. Um, the board, we, we're a lean organization. I can promise you that. Every board meeting, we go in depth on our financial statements. Um, and we are sensitive to smaller MLSs that see this as maybe a barrier. Um, we evaluate our fees every single year at the board level. Um, but we are really just trying to operate the organization as lean as possible, and so it's, it's a nonprofit entity. We're not trying to make profit off of MLSs. Yes, th thank you, Rebecca, and that is absolutely true. Our financials are to support the community. Um, zero profit whatsoever for Rezo in doing so. Um, 
Uh, there was a question about Jeremy? Louisa's participation. That, Jeremy? Yes, go ahead. This is Cindy. I just wanted to, because we've hit the hour, so I just want to acknowledge that, that we are there. And as I discussed yes. in the beginning, that um, we will continue. Jeremy will keep talking and answering these questions. And I would ask if Richard and Rebecca would, would stay on. And great conversation and fantastic information. But I just want to acknowledge that we have hit that hour. So if anybody does need to get off um, and, and or has other things, then please feel free to do that. But we are going to continue talking because it does sound like Jeremy has uh, lots of questions on there. And so we'll, we'll keep going until we kind of get through uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of those, but uh, Jeremy, do you have a, a contact slide next? Um, I do. Let me thank you. If you get that up there, just so everybody has um, the information and can reach out separately, and appreciate everyone's participation today. Um, and then I will let you get back to answering questions because it's some great conversation. Uh, thank you, thank you, Danae. Um, going through, I'll try to wrap this up in the next ten minutes, unless the questions keep flowing. Um, is there going to be a Rezo seminar or presence at CMLS conference? Absolutely. We are working with CMLS. We will have a booth there. I'll be there to answer any questions directly, and um, we will have material, and hopefully uh, Danae will uh, also accommodate us on the agenda. We will also have an expo booth at the NAR fall conference in San Diego. So we will have a booth within the NAR area on the expo floor. I will be there as well as Greg Lemon, who is our certification expert. So if you're unable to attend the CMLS conference in October, the Reese conference in Austin, then you can visit us at NAR at the expo booth in person and ask us questions there. We'll also be providing certification testing so if you would like to see what that looks like on site, we will be prepared to do some certification testing if you're ready at that time. Uh, there is a comment, uh, MLS Vendor Black Knight is applying for certification on behalf of all its customers. Is that correct? That is an unknown to me. I am in communication with Black Knight on a regular basis. However, I do not have an answer to that question, and I would have to refer you back to Black Knight. There has been a conversation of trying to aid their customers in applying for certification, but we have not moved forward with any actual details on doing so. So I would have to refer that question back to your representative at Black Knight to ask them their status of data dictionary certification and what process and assistance they're going to be helping their MLS customers with. Um, once certified, will we receive the certified logo? Absolutely. We do have a Rezo certified logo, so when you apply for certification, there is a trademark license agreement which you sign, which gives you the benefit of using the Rezo certified logo. So that will be sent to you as the MLS, and you can put that on, that web, on your website or use it in your material once you get your certification. So you will be provided that, not your MLS vendor. Are versions 1.3, 1.4 directly related to core bronze platinum certification levels each year? Uh, yes, they are, and they are growing. If you go to rezo.org today and you go look at, there is a spreadsheet we just loaded that says one data dictionary 1.4 under the data dictionary menu option under resources. When you pull the 1.4 spreadsheet up, it lists all of the fields that are in 1.4 and all of the values. And then there is also a designation, is that a core field, or is that a bronze field, or is that a gold field? So those do apply for those for future years of certification. The first two years require core. After the first two years, move into 2017, if you have done your core certification, we will want you to move into the bronze level of an adoption, which is just a higher level of adoption of the fields within 1.4. Um, how can we obtain the recorded version of this session? We are going to post that, I believe, today on, on CMLS.org, and we will post it on Rezo.org as well once we have the link. Uh, is the 1.4 Data Dictionary uh, available on the Rezo site? Yes, as of today, it is now available. So when you go to the Data Dictionary resource, you'll see on the right-hand side at the very top of the right rail, Data Dictionary 1.4 as it was just loaded 
and you'll see Data Dictionary 1.3 right below it. So you can actually take a look at those. We will be providing a change documentation. It's not been finalized as of yet, but should be over the next week. So you could actually see what are the differences between 1.3 and 1.4. And as we've tried to reiterate, the differences on growth as opposed to change. Is the annual fee billed to the MLS or the MLS vendor? For membership, it's the MLS organization. For certification, for data dictionary, again, is the MLS organization. Our vendor, many vendors in the industry are also members. They pay their own fee schedule that is outside of the relationship between you and your vendor. So the vendors are often members of Rezo because they help participate in standards creation and development. But the relationship there is the vendors are the members. For your MLS to be a member of Rezo, then you would need to pay Rezo directly for membership or for certification. Rezo does not have money typically between an MLS and the MLS vendor passed back to Rezo. That, that doesn't occur. Um, uh, there's a follow-up question is that a particular MLS vendor has presented the board a cost for the MLS vendor implementing certification. Is that cost by Rezo or by the vendor? The, some vendors may or may not charge their MLS customers for technology projects. Some vendors may be charging for data dictionary certification implementation similarly to how they would charge you for new software features and other like. Other vendors may not be charging for that. Uh, whatever your vendor charges you, that is outside of Rezo's fee schedule for certification, just to be clear. That would be between you and your technology vendor. Uh, great question. How does someone get involved in the committee? Most of our extended long time work group or committee participants are actually members. So once you join as a member, there is an entire work group side to the website that you don't see today. So once you would join anyone in your organization could be part of any work group. We have many work groups. Research and development is the work group that's the funnel for all new ideas. And then from that funnel, they distribute that to appropriate work groups such as data dictionary. Uh, as a member, you can belong to any work group. As a guest, you're also welcome to participate in the work group to the level to submit new ideas, join a work group meeting, and listen to how that new idea is vetted out. So if you weren't a Rezo member, you could email info at rezo.org, whatever idea you had that might be applicable to a work group, and we could present that idea for you and help you join the call and talk about that. We've most recently had a few brokers that were non-members present ideas, as well as a few MLSs that were not members. But we do find that usually they like to be a full member so they can be involved on the work group or committee on a long-term basis. So once you join Rezo, if you will let myself or any staff know, just at info.org, what work groups you might be interested in, then we can add you into those work groups and get you set up for those schedules. They meet virtually on a week or a monthly basis for the majority of them. Has the worksheet used to map the MLS data between for 1.4 been updated? There is an updated starter kit. So for some of you that are doing data mapping yourselves, there is a starter kit on the website that helps guide you through data mapping. There is a starter kit there for 1.4 as well. And we'll make sure it was just loaded. We'll make sure we have some QA on that as well. Um, and that is the final question in the window. So I don't see any more questions coming through. And I believe that we're 15 minutes over time. So I would like to thank everyone. My contact information, again, is on the screen. For anything, any questions, you can email myself or info at rezo.org. And if you have any specific certification questions, and we've had some great ones today, then you can email certification at rezo.org and our certification experts will get back to you quickly with an answer to your questions. I wanna thank Danae for helping facilitate this and remind everyone this is the first of a three-part series. 
So in three weeks, we will have a more technical conversation about the data dictionary and what is its plans for the future. And then another three weeks, we'll actually have a detailed conversation about the certification process and the implementation process. I also want to thank Rebecca and Richard for participating on the panel. I believe they've added some great insight to the conversations today. So as soon as we have these links up, we will provide these out. And again, if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to contact me immediately in any manner you like, and we'll make sure we get those answered. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a great week.